Good morning, Source family. How you doing? It is a beautiful day, is it not? How are my prophets doing today? You doing all right? Good, good. I, I just want to take a moment to, to, uh, to thank you real quick. Uh, I want you to know that I am thankful for you. I'm thankful for this space. I'm thankful that we can be a family here together. Over the last couple weeks, I have experienced joy in this place. Joy that I had been wanting, desiring, and hoping for for a very long time over the last year and a half. And as we continue to gather, as we continue to seek God into this new season, um, I want you to know that you are speaking life through the Spirit and joy into my heart. And I am thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the ways in which we are being led forward. Speaking of being led forward, we're starting a new sermon series where we're going to cover the principle, the core principles of what we hope to be as the church. Not just here as the source, but together, corporately as First Methodists. These are the things that we value. And the first week, this first week, what we want to talk about is worship. Worship, and the beauty of worship, the purpose of worship. Our scripture today comes from Exodus, and so just to give you a little background on this command, right, to keep the Sabbath, to keep it holy, to take Sabbath time, this is coming out of a freed people, a redeemed people, a restored people. So the people of God have been in slavery in Egypt. Right, And so they had been generations of slavery and oppression, and God frees them from that oppression. He delivers them from that by his power. He leads them out of Egypt. He defeats Pharaoh. He uses his power to defeat him and bring the people out of slavery. So this is a new, freed, delivered people. And this commandment is happening right after that deliverance. So we've just walked through the deliverance of the people. Now they're sitting at Mount Sinai, and they're coming to terms with, well, now what? (laughs) Right? Because it's not just one thing to be freed, but now what do you do with that freedom? They had been working and on this journey of freedom and, and battling with that, but now they find themselves in that place. And the question is, is who are they going to be? They've only known control over their lives. They've only known that oppression. What are we going to be? And so God meets them on the mountain. And he brings them the law. He brings them these commandments. He brings them a way of life to set them apart. Another way to say it is God brings them to a purpose in their freedom. He brings them to a purpose, and that purpose is God himself. He calls the people. He calls the people to a covenant. It's not just Moses that makes the covenant with God. It is the entire people who make a covenant with God to say, we will be your people, and we will worship you alone. God calls them to purpose to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to be a nation fully devoted to God alone. God says, you will worship me and nothing else. Nothing in heaven, no spiritual forces, nothing in this world, no earthly thing, nothing in the sea, anything that you can imagine besides me, not that you will worship and be dedicated to me alone. God is wanting to set them apart, to set them as a witness, as an example of what God is and what God calls us to be. And he forms this people around his presence, around his love and around his mercy to be a people who are full of justice and mercy, a witness to the world around them. So these people are called to a purpose, to be a witness, to be the presence and witness and light of God in the world. And God promises to dwell with them in that. It's quite the task. But God says, listen, for if you walk away if you, if, you, if you seek to attack me, if you seek to curse me, I'm going to curse you to the next generation. But my mercy for those who love me unfolds a thousand times more. 
And he calls the people to persevere. He calls the people to persevere in that pursuit, in that worship, in that trust, in that full trust of God. To persevere wholly, fully, from generation to generation to generation. And the heart of this, the heart of this perseverance, the heart of what God wants them to be is people who are reliant on God's mercy, God's love, God's power. He does not call the people to persevere on their own ability to build, to build a kingdom or to build any kind of structure or anything like that. Not on their ability to figure out what's right, but on God's power and God's command and God's word to persevere through God himself. To be people who say, not my will, but yours, God. You are the one enacting this mercy. You are the one leading us. You are the one whose power we rely on. It is by God's power they were freed. It was by God's power they were given even the promise to be a people. It is by God's power that will lead them forward. And so God calls them to persevere, to continue forward, to trust wholly on that mercy, that mercy that extends a thousand times over, that love that extends a thousand times over. But this is difficult, right? Okay, so we're people who are supposed to be wholly devoted to God, wholly devoted to God himself. He is our main purpose, our main driving force. Above all else, we follow God. Nothing in this world, nothing else, no other gods, nothing. We follow God, and we are called to persevere, to rely on his power. His power and his love. And the way he calls the people to do that is through praise, is through worship. They structure, the whole structure of the people structures around the presence of God. It's what's going to drive them forward. It's what's going to lead them into the next promised land and through the wilderness. It is the presence of God who leads them forward. And they form their lives in praise and worship of that presence of God's power, of God's mercy, and God's love. And they do this in three ways. They do it through worship in maybe a traditional sense that we might understand it. They gather. They bring sacrifices. They bring them places to desiring and naming that they are not perfect and that they need God's love and God's forgiveness. That they need God's mercy. And so they structure elements of worship and the tabernacle and sacrifices to bring themselves of places of reminding Reminding of God's call, that God alone is worshipped, and that God forgives and brings mercy. To be people who are rooted in that way. Another way God calls them to be is to be the living embodiment of justice and love within the community itself. Their daily life. So they praise and worship through their daily practices. There starts to begin like all these outlines of what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to care and not covet and care for the, those around you and the, the foreigner amongst you, not to oppress them and all these things. And they, it winds these, uh, this outline of this kind of like code to shape the community that is different from the world around them. Places where justice can happen. Places where human life is valued on a higher scale than it is in places around them. They are supposed to be the living embodiment in their daily lives of justice and love for each other. That separates them from the world. And lastly, and this is the most radical is they are called to have a day where that justice, love, and mercy is the only thing that happens. Where God's power, God's trust is fully committed to the Sabbath. A day where nobody works, no slave, no property, no nothing, anything, everything must rest. There's no power structure there that's happening. There's no, like, the elite get to take a break and the slaves don't. Everybody must rest. The lambs, the cattle, 
the people, everything, must rest on this holy day, a day fully devoted to the trust of God, saying, on this day, we will trust in nobody. We will look to nobody. We will do nothing else but acknowledge that God is king, that God's power reigns, that he is the source of all goodness, the source of all creation, a whole day dedicated to God. A powerful witness of the justice and love and mercy that God calls the world to and a holy space where people are tuned in and tune in to what matters most in this world and that is our creator. It's radical and it's wild and it's beautiful. And so we have this purpose. God alone, God is sovereign, God is all powerful, God is our purpose. We are supposed to persevere in his love and his mercy by his power alone. And we do that by worshiping, by, by creating spaces of worship where we're reminded of that, where we practice that in our daily lives, where we live that truth out in our daily lives, and where we give a whole day to God, putting away our expectations, our anxieties, our to-do lists to fully hone in on God's presence. Today is the 4th of July, where we celebrate, right, America's declaration of independence, where we declare our independence from a monarchy. We're freeing ourselves from oppression, and then we create this space where all men are created equal, right? Right? That's what we celebrate today. But as we celebrate our independence, we have to think back at the history. And the truth is, is that phrase, all men are created equal, wasn't fully true. And as a nation, we have walked slowly to realize that's not just for men, and it's not just for white dudes, <laughs> right? We have slowly learned as a nation that, that that is something bigger than we thought, something we've had to grow in, something we've had to step into, that we've had to struggle with, that we still struggle with. And we are blessed to be in a place where we can outwardly have that conversation. But here's the truth. America wasn't the first to proclaim justice and freedom for humanity. The people of God are just doing it right here. They're, they're declaring that freedom and justice for themselves. And the truth is, is that freedom and justice is really going back to what God intended from the very beginning. This march towards love and justice and freedom and trust in God has been going on for a very long, long time. And we are the church the beauty of the church is that we aren't just a church today, but we stand on the generations that have explored, that have walked with the presence and the power of God that have come before us, countless generations before us, walking with, seeking after, and proclaiming the purpose and the sovereignty of God. That is our rally call. That is who we are. We are people who are wholly reliant on the purpose. God alone in all things. No power structure. No king. No perfect plan. No perfect form of society. No economic system. We are people who are wholly reliant on God, and we have been that in countless countries, in countless places in this world. Even globally today, Christians around the world practice their faith in all kinds of contexts. We are the people of the purpose. Can I get an amen? We are people of purpose, people who believe that the creator of all things that breathes life into all things continues to breathe life into us now that we wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the mercy and the grace of our creator God. 
And if we want to live the life that is best, that has been designed, that has been created for us, it is in harmony, in relationship with that creator. We are people of the new covenant who know God's mercy on a level that we, the world has never known. His mercy has unfolded. Our understanding of love and justice has unfolded from generation to generation. God is leading us to something greater, a greater thing. Him, God himself, our purpose. And he's doing that through perseverance, calling us to rely on his mercy, his love, and his justice. To be people who hone ourselves to that, who tune ourselves to that, who rely on that in all things, in all places in our lives. To surround ourselves around the presence of God. And we do that in worship. We do that by worshiping in all places and in all things, in all seasons. We do it in the face of darkness and we do it in the face of the light. We worship because we know God is good. That every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. And so we do wonderful things like communion to experience that living presence, that that sacrifice of Jesus, that, that display of mercy and love beyond our comprehension, that place where in our darkest relationship with God, where we killed his son, he chose love. God chose love in that space. We tune our lives in our daily life with our families, asking what does the mercy and the love and the call of God mean in this space with our families, with our careers, as we walk down the street, as we drive down the highway, what does it mean to be people who practice mercy, practice justice, stand for those things? And as difficult as that task is, we as the church know that it's important to gather, to be that for each other, to have a day where we come and we don't just sing praises, we don't just proclaim, but we practice. A day that is not about our checklist, a day that is not about the things that we need to accomplish, about the future that is to come, a day wholly devoted to loving and caring and resting in the presence of our great God, the Sabbath. Worship is all-encompassing in all that we do. And the Sabbath is our rally call. It is our place. It is the, God, the place ordained by God from the very beginning. Exodus cites the creation that on the seventh day God rested. And I interpret that along with many that it wasn't that God needed rest. God created rest as part of creation itself that we were designed to rest in the presence of our God, in the presence of what he calls his creation to be. And that is what we do as the church. My hope and my prayer, because I believe we are at a Mount Sinai moment in the church. I don't mean it just for First Methodist. I don't mean it just for the source. I mean the church. I believe we are at a mountain experience where God is trying to reveal. We've been delivered from the season. We are being delivered. We are in freedom. We are experiencing freedom again. But God wants to bring us to new spaces where we are reliant on his spirit and his power. Can I get an amen? God is leading us to something bigger and greater. I believe that. I hope that. I want to proclaim that. I want to rely on it. And so my hope here at The Source is that we would practice that, that we would be bold enough together. We, the prophets of God, the people of God, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, would be bold enough to practice that, to give God a day. To just start by giving God a whole day of our lives to pursue that. That we could come here, that we can worship together, we can celebrate, we can sing songs of praise. 
but we can also pray for each other here and now that we can go out with each other into the world today here and now be with each other, show each other love, kindness, encouragement. That we would practice boldly and radically love and justice with each other that we might be bold enough to extend it to the world. Amen? That we might lead our nations and the church can lead the other nations to the definition from creation of what love and justice is supposed to be. Not to rely on the things of the world to define it for us, but for us to rely on the one who created it. So that we can find truly, continue to march with God as he continues to reveal the love and mercy and justice that's really truly beyond our comprehension. Because if we read the scripture, what we realize very quickly is God is sovereign, he's all powerful, but also that we don't always get it right. That we are on a journey. The prophets had to come and say, someone has to change the heart of man. Someone has to change our hearts. We stand as the witness to that promise, the changed hearts, but God is still doing a work because as we grow in love and justice in the church, the world grows in its ability to oppress, destroy, and kill. There's a battle happening. We have the the ability to kill more people than we ever have in the history of humanity. We also have the ability to rely on the power and the love of God in a way that is beyond our comprehension. We have a call. We have a purpose. We have hope because God is already victorious. Because we have the promise that we win. (laughs) We win. And so when we look at the darkness of the world, we look at the news, we see these things that seem to say, you are powerless, we know the one who is all-powerful. And we know the ways he's delivered us. We rely on the ways he's delivered us because we know he will deliver us again. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this space. We thank you that we can rest in your presence, that we can be people of your love and your mercy. Lord, that we can be people who are a part of your purpose, that you even allow us to be a part of your purpose. Thank you for the breath that you give. Thank you for the love that you give. Lord, we give ourselves to you. In this moment of worship, we lay down our lives. We lay down our lists. We lay down our anxieties, Lord. We want to see you move. So move in this space. We give you this time, we give you our lives, in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.